So thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to participate in my fourth workshop. Hopefully next time it'll be in person. So I'm going to, some of you may know a lot about fluorescence, some less. So I think to be sure we are all starting equally, I want to go through the fundamentals of fluorescence phenomena and illustrate some methods just to sort of set us, uh, set us off properly. Um, now, for some reason now, my, uh, there we are. Okay, so what is fluorescence? So a simple way to put it is it's the light emitted by an atom or molecule after a finite duration subsequent to absorption of electromagnetic energy. Specifically, uh, the emitted light arrives from a transition of the excited species from the first excited state to the ground electronic level, usually. And um, it's been the development of highly sophisticated probe chemistries, new laser microscope approaches, and site-directed mutagenesis has led to many of the novel applications of fluorescence in the chemical, physical, and life sciences. So why do we do fluorescence? Well, first of all, it's pretty, but that's not just a glib answer. When I started my graduate work with Gregorio Weber, who we will learn much more about later, uh, he pointed out to me that what attracted him partly was the aesthetic quality. By looking at changes in color, you can understand phenomena at the molecular level. And of course, fluorescence provides information on the molecular environment and fluorescence probes have been developed which respond to any number of physical or chemical uh, environments, viscosity, polarity, temperature, pH, et cetera, et cetera. And also very important, it provides information on dynamic processes on the nanosecond timescale. Fluorescent probes are essentially molecular stopwatches which monitor dynamic events that occur during the excited state lifetime, such as movements of proteins or protein domains. And we'll see examples throughout this course. So coupled with modern fluorescent microscopy, which we'll learn a lot about, confocal, multi-photon, et cetera, and fluorescent proteins, such as green fluorescent protein, et cetera, fluorescence provides extremely detailed spatial information in living cells, as well as information on the dynamics of cellular components. And it's also very, very, very sensitive. Working with sub-nanomolar concentrations is routine, where femtomolar or even single molecule studies are possible with some effort. The type of uh, systems we look at are molecular structure and dynamics, cell organization and function, engineered services for high throughput uh, drug discovery, for example, and live animals. Instrumentation include fluorimeters and fluorometers. We'll learn the difference between that. Of course, a wide variety of microscopes, uh, high throughput plate readers, and again, as I said, intravital imaging. So almost all fluorescence uh, phenomena in any research progress will fall into um, several categories like the fluorescence emission spectrum, the excitation spectrum, the quantum yield, the polarization or anisotropy of the emission, the fluorescent lifetime. In this lecture, we're gonna look at each of these categories and discuss the underlying concept and practical considerations. So we usually start to think about fluorescence from the peren jablonski diagram, which basically shows you, here we see depicted the different uh, ground states, S0, and then excited state, S1, S2, uh, and higher energy, we're showing vertically higher. And the absorption phenomena starts usually from the lowest vibrational level of the ground state. And we can absorb light to different levels uh, in the excited state to S1 or S2 and to different um, vibrational manifolds in these excited states. But regardless of where we excite, we have rapid internal conversion which takes us to the lowest vibrational level of the first excited state. And there, uh, the excited molecule rests for some time before it can emit light as fluorescence, or it may undergo a radiationless decay process, which removes the excitation, or even in some cases, inner system crossing to a triplet state, which leads to phosphorescence. But we're mainly concerned, of course, with the fluorescence phenomena. So 
typical emission spectrum, the excitation wavelength is fixed and the fluorescence intensity versus wavelength is obtained. And here we see four emission spectra for different molecules, quinine sulfate, fluorescein, uh, rhodamine, and ethidium bromide. And this shows the test tubes with those compounds to show you how the color you perceive with your eye correlates with the emission spectra. So you can see that uh, it's very easy to distinguish the different colors um, when you look at it this way. And in fact, when you've do done fluorescence for a long, long time, you get very good at estimating the emission maximum just by looking at the color. Usually your eye is sensitive to a few nanometers shift one way or the other. Now, early examination of a lot of spectra resulted in some general observations, namely in a pure substance which exists in solution in a unique form, the fluorescent spectrum is invariant. That means it doesn't change when you change the excitation wavelength. The fluorescent spectrum usually lies at longer wavelengths than the absorption. And the fluorescent spectrum is to a good approximation a mere image of the absorption band of, of least frequency. So here to show the first case, we look at solutions of fluorescein in a cuvette, we're taking the spectra, and on the left, we see excited at different wavelengths. And we see that um, at 470, we get the largest uh, peak and the other ones are smaller. Uh, and this is a function not only of how well the molecule, in this case, fluorescein absorbs light, but also the amount of light coming through the instrument. So there's instrumentation factors. But on the right, we see we can normalize these spectrum on the computer and they're all the same. It doesn't matter where we excite 280, 375, 470. So it shows regardless of where we excite, the emission spectrum stays the same for a, a, a unique compound. Um, these are not corrected for instrumentation parameters. That's another topic. Here we see the absorption and emission of fluorescein and alkaline solution. You see in black, the absorption, in green, the fluorescence. And you see generally it's shifted to um, longer wavelength. This is what's known as the Stokes shift. We'll learn about that later. And here, perhaps the less commonly uh, referred to property is um, that the uh, emission spectrum in the dotted line is roughly a mirror image of the, of the uh, absorption band of lower frequency. And all of these properties follow from considerations of the peren jablonski diagram, namely, regardless of where we excite, in whatever wavelength we excite, we rapidly get um, loss of energy to stay in the lowest level of the, the lowest vibrational level of the first excited state, and then we have the emission process. So we see that it's, it doesn't matter where we excite, we're always gonna get the same emission. And at room temperature, fluorophores usually start at the lowest vibrational level, okay? And hence, when the emission comes, when we have the emission process, we're going to different vibrational levels in the ground state which means it'll be less energy. That accounts for this, the shift called the Stokes shift. And finally, the spacings of the energy uh, levels in these vibrational manifolds, as they're called, is roughly the same in, in the ground in the first excited state, which accounts for the mirror image property. So um, let's consider the, the first property, the quantum yield. So the relative efficiencies of different wavelengths I'm sorry, the excitation spectrum. The, the top of my screen is blocked by <laughs> the zoom things. So um, usually for the, um, when we do excitation spectrum, we fix the emission monochromator or filter at a certain wavelength and then we change the excitation and we get um, a spectrum. And if it's well behaved, that is those three general rules we discussed hold, we would expect the excitation to match the absorption spectrum. But in this case, you have to do uh, significant instrumentation corrections. And we won't go into that now, but here we see uh, from taken in my lab, the 
the absorption spectrum and corrected excitation spectrum for ANS, analytical naphthalene sulfonate and ethanol. And we can see that they match extremely well, which they should in most cases. Now, if they don't match, that usually means something's interesting. For example, let's consider this is the excitation spectrum of some fluorescent probe free in solution. But now we look at it, if it, suppose it can bind to a protein, we might see this excitation spectrum. And you see a big increase in the excitation spectrum around 280. And these cases indicate energy transfer from a protein's tryptophan residues, which can absorb and emit, to the bound fluorophores. So this is just a very, very brief example of how excitation spectrum can give you information also of what's going on in your system. So the quantum yield was introduced in 1924 by Vavilov, and the simplest definition is it represents the number of photons emitted divided by the number of photons absorbed. Okay, so if a fluorophore absorbs 100 photons, for example, and emits 100 photons, its quantum yield is one or 100%. If it absorbs 100 and emits only 20, then the quantum yield is 0.2 or 20%. But a more insightful definition would be the quantum yield equals the rate of emission processes divided by the sum of the rates of all other deactivation processes. Okay, so other processes like non radiative deactivation pho include photochemical, dissociative things. So there's a number of things that can deactivate, quenching, which we'll talk about, um, and that will lower the quantum yield. Now, I wanted to show this. This is a table from Bernard Velour's excellent book on fluorescence, and it shows the quantum yield for a number of compounds, starting from benzene, tryptophan, up to rhodamines, and we can see that the quantum yield varies greatly, and in this sense, Ultimately, this is what determines if a molecule is a useful fluor fluorescent probe or not. Uh, for example, uh, the, the DNA, adenine, guanine, the bases in DNA technically fluoresce, but the quantum yield is very, 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 very low so that it's not practical. So you don't think of that as being a fluorophore. But to be practical, you have to have it at least a few percent. And here we see a lot of them. And we see that we go up to, um, we can go up to 100%, rhodamine 101. But I want to add that quantum yields are notoriously difficult to measure. For example, reliable quotation marks, literature values for quinine sulfate range from about 0.5 to 0.7. So when I read a manuscript where they talk about a quantum yield of some probe, I like to see how they determine that. And usually they just compare it to something else, like people doing proteins would compare to a tryptophan derivative. And then they usually tell you what quantum yield they use for the reference compound. But when they report that, then I can judge on my own if I think that's a reliable value or not. So it's not, despite what instrument manufacturers tell you, it's not a trivial matter to do a quantum yield. Um, so let's talk about polarization and you won't probably get much of that in the course, but I'm just going to give a little overview because it is a very important, uh, um, technique polarization of fluorescence. So we can think of light having an oscillating electrical and magnetic field perpendicular to the direction of light propagation. In this lecture, these lectures, we're only concerned with the electrical component. So in natural light, the electric field vector can assume any direction of oscillation perpendicular or normal to the light propagation direction. And a polarizer is a device that's inserted in the light path that can be rotated to change the direction of polarization. And usually nowadays we use uh, rather expensive crystal polarizers that deviate one polarization plane from another, but you can get the polarization you want. So we can consider a cuvette, and again, this little quartz or glass cuvette at the center of our, of our optical system. So the exciting light travels along the X direction, 
and we can have a polarizer that selects one direction of the electric vector. And then that hits the sample and we get fluorescence comes out. Now we look at 90 degrees normally, at normal, so I'm trying to show, like if the light's in the plane, the emission is coming out towards you sitting looking at the screen. And we can rotate the polarizer to see how much is in the parallel direction and how much is perpendicular. And then the polarization is defined as the intensity parallel minus the intensity perpendicular over the sum of those terms. Another term very often used in the context of polarized emission is the anisotropy, usually designated uh, as A or R, which is defined as the parallel minus perpendicular over parallel plus two I perpendicular. So it's a small difference, but it, it changes the numbers as we see. Now, obviously you can rearrange terms and you see anisotropy is two thirds times one over P minus the third, the minus one, or anisotropy is two P over three minus P. For example, if the polarization is 0.5, the anisotropy is 0.4, 0.25, 0.2, et cetera. And most modern instrumentation will give you the readout of both polarization and anisotropy. Now, clearly the information content in polarization or anisotropy function is essentially identical and using one term or the other is dictated by practical considerations. In fact, just to jump ahead a little bit, in the clinical sciences, they almost always use the polarization function Whereas in most biophysical, biophysical measurements, they report anisotropy, but clearly it's the same information. Now, going on just a little bit more with polarization, uh, perhaps the most important um, aspect to think about is when you excite an ensemble of randomly oriented fluorophores with plain polarized light, you're performing a photo selection process. And that's the key you're picking out molecules that are more or less lined up with the polarization direction of the excitation. And that's because the molecule, um, normally the fluorescent molecules have a dipole moment in the excited state that's different from the dipole moment in the ground state. Okay, and so when you're lined up with the polarization direction of the exciting light, more or less with that ground state uh, dipole moment, the probability of absorption is higher. In fact, the probability that a molecule will absorb light is proportional to the cosine squared of the angle between the exciting light, the polarization direction of the exciting light, and this transition dipole moment. So even if it's at a large angle, you can still get some excitation, but not as much. So if we look at an ensemble of molecules and I've drawn on them the their dipole moments, and we shine light on them, we can see when it's brighter green, the ones that are more strongly lined up, and the black ones are at a large angle, they don't absorb the light at all, but other ones can absorb to a less, less extent. Okay, and usually the, um, um, when you excite in the first uh, electronic state, the emission dipole well, regardless of where you excite, I'm sorry, the emission dipole is normally collinear with the excitation, but now we can consider how many molecules do you excite that are perfectly lined up, where there's fewer molecules lined up perfectly that are lined up at an angle. Think of a globe and look at the, the direction to the North Pole relative to the equator. There's many, many more on the equator, obviously. So the probability of absorbing light is proportional to how well they're lined up, but the number of molecules that are lined up is less as you, as you um, get collinear. So when you take all this into account, and we won't go through the mathematics, you can see that the limiting polarization, and this is an important concept, the limiting polarization, if you have a random orientation in solution, is going to be one half, okay, 0.5. So only if you have a crystal where everything's fixed in space can you get higher. But in solution, randomly oriented, it'll be a half. Uh, and that assumes the emission dipole is parallel to the absorption. Um, so we can look at 
Here we see an absorption spectrum in the solid line, and we see the emission, which is at longer wavelength. And next to it, we have a Perrin Jablonski diagram, and we can see that we excite any place, the emission is from the same place. And in fact, this, is, this depicts roughly a phenol. And here I show on the molecule the direction of the transition dipoles. And you can see that the, um, the S0, S1 is, uh, is at one orientation, the S0, S2 another. So now consider the population of molecules. And I excite in S0, S1. I'm picking out these molecules to excite. And the polarization, the emission dipole is roughly parallel. So the average direction is depicted here. It's going to be largely polarized. But suppose I use another wavelength. I'm picking out a different population of molecules. I'm picking out the molecules that have the S0, uh, S2, in a, which will be in a different orientation. This shows you it's a different population I'm trying to depict here. And the emission is going to be the same as before, but this time it'll be largely perpendicular. So the main point is that if you excite where the um, you know, absorption dipole at 90 degrees to um, the other wavelength, you can go down to the limit of minus a third. So the limits of polarization, and this is the final point, go from plus a half to minus a third. And it depends on the exciting wavelength. And there's an equation that tells us the polarization will observe uh, rough related to the angle of orientation between um, uh, the absorption and the emission dipoles. Um, so what that means is if you change the wavelength and look at polarization, you'll get something like this, the polarization spectrum. And this is one of Gregory Weber's original diagrams from the 1960s for phenol. And basically that's the point I wanna make because it's happened that you see in the literature occasionally people doing polarization, but they're exciting at a wavelength that's not going to give you what they assume. And this has happened because in more recent times, people are more prone to use lasers to excite, which have specific wavelengths. This just shows different molecules, how their intrinsic polarization changes with wavelength. You can see tryptophan is very complicated. For example, people that excite at uh, 280, your polarization can be lower if you can go over a very narrow wavelength range, higher or very low. And some people excited 295 for reasons I won't get into. And you can see how that's right on this steep thing. So it's better for something like protein to go at 300 nanometers or above where it's high and stable. This shows the polarization spectrum of rhodamine. Here it is of porphyrin. And you see on porphyrin, it changes wildly with excitation wavelength. And people that use lasers have better be sure they're, they know the polarization at the wavelength they're using. Again, you won't do much in this course, I don't believe, but people are doing polarization with microscopes now. So it, it, uh, it becomes more important. And here's the excitation polarization spectrum of green fluorescent protein. And you can see that we reach a, a high stable value once we're in the visible wavelength range. Now, you'll hear about multi-photon lasers, uh, light sources in this course. And actually, uh, if you're doing polarization or anisotropy, it, it depends if you're doing one photon, two photons, three photons, and I won't go into the reason why, but the photo selection process is different. Okay, but most of you don't wanna do polarization on molecules frozen. You want to see what happens if the molecule can rotate, and that's the value of polarization. So imagine you have an absorption dipole lined up, and we're selecting these, and the emission dipole is at some angle, which will affect the observed polarization. Now, instead of frozen, we allow the molecule to rotate during the excited state lifetime, and when it emits light, we pass through a certain angle, okay? So you get a depolarization process due to the rotation. And that's the value of polarization, as we'll see. It allows you to study um, these molecular motions during very short time scale, namely the lifetime of the excited state, which is in the nanosecond range.
So in fact, we can see that the observed polarization will be related to the intrinsic factor, which I discussed when there's no rotation, over two times three cosine squared omega minus one, where omega is the extrinsic factor, how much it rotates during the excited state lifetime. So here we depict it in this diagram. We normally have an isotropic random or distribution of orientations. We photo select some of them, and during the excited state process, they can rotate, which will obviously change the observed polarization or anisotropy. And Francis Perrin, already in 1926, laid out the equation relating the lifetime to the, polariz to the polarization to the lifetime and to the rotational rate of the molecule. And rho is the Debye rotational relaxation time. That's the time for a given orientation to rotate through an angle given by the arc cosine of one over E or 68.42 degrees. Obviously, the rotation, the Debye re rotational relaxation time is related to the viscosity of the solution. The more viscous, the less it rotates. The molecular volume of the fluorescent unit over gas constant times temperature. For a spherical protein, you can relate it to the molecular weight of the protein time, with times of partial specific volume and degree of hydration. So the idea is this. If we have a fluorophore free in solution, it can rotate quickly, which will give you a low polarization. Suppose that fluorophore is linked to a, a protein or a large molecule, then it's a slow polarization, a slow rotation, a high polarization. Now, one other note I want to make, in the literature, you sometimes see people use rotational correlation time instead of the birotational relaxation time. The information content is similar because the rotational relaxation time is exactly three times the correlation time. The correlation time is how long it takes to rotate through 55 degrees. And this is because Perrin originally followed the work of Dubai on dielectric phenomena to do the rotation or relaxation time. But in the 50s, Conrad Block defined correlation time for NMR. So you often see people mixing and matching anisotropy, correlation time, polarization, relaxation time. And the Perrin equation in terms of anisotropy and correlation time would look like this. But the important thing the reason I mention this is when you're reading the literature, which I presume you do or will do you want to be very clear what they're reporting on. Because uh, in order to understand how it relates to your own work, you better be clear what terms they're using. So um, here's an example of when you have a probe attached to a, a protein, for example, the polarization you observe is due to several things. It's the rotation uh, of the, the overall rotation, in this case of a dimer, the movement of one domain relative to another, and the movement of the dye molecule around its point of attachment. And this is, can be an important phenomenon because you can have a significant amount of probe mobility depending on how the attachment is to the protein, for example, or any other macromolecule you're using. Um, and just to show you how useful this can be, and certainly my PhD thesis was largely concerned with protein dissociation. If we have a dimer monomer equilibrium like this, now following, we can either follow intrinsic polarization, if possible tryptophan, or you label it. You put a probe in to attach it to the protein. Clearly, the, um, when it dissociates into monomers, it's going to rotate more quickly than the dimer. So you'll get a change in polarization. So this is what you would see if you plot the polarization versus the concentration. You have a monomeric protein like lysozyme labeled with fluorescein ethocyanate. You might get a, steady, a constant steady polarization. If you have a dimer, in this case, the protein I studied, ribosomal protein L7, L12, you can see a clear dissociation curve. And in fact, the actual value at any point depends on obviously the lifetime of the probe, the size, size of the protein, the local mobility. But for most cases, we're not trying to understand exact, exactly the origins of the exact polarization value. We want to see changes. 
And here we can see a clear dimered monomer transition. And here's another very popular use. And thousands of studies have done like this, where we have a fluorescent probe, in this case, a fluorescent GTP analog that binds to a GTP uh, binding protein. And at no protein concentration, the polarization or anisotropy is low. And as we add more and more proteins, it goes up and up. So this is a method to easily follow the binding constant of a, of a fluorescent ligand to a protein. Again, very popular, especially in, in, it affects a lot of clinical work. In fact, the first commercial instrument to measure polarization was introduced by Abbott Labs in 1981. And one of the reasons for this is before this came up, most binding studies were done with radioisotopes where you'd put in a radioactive ligand and you'd pass it over a column or a filter to see how much is bound. And it was really in an effort to remove radioactivity from um, common usage that they developed this method. And I think it's easier to just show you the diagram. So the idea of the, the Abbott machine, which is still used today a lot, you have an antibody to a ligand. So you have a ligand, an antigen that you're interested in. Maybe it's, for example, it's used for, for drugs uh, or, or metabolites, and you link a fluorophore to it. Now, you start off with a high polarization because you have the conditions such that most of the fluorophore linked antigen is bound, so you get a high polarization. Now you add the fluid of interest, whether it's blood or urine or something, and you have, you're looking for unlabeled antigens in, in there, like a drug, for example. And if there's a significant amount of unlabeled antigens, it's going to displace the fluorophore linked antigen from the antibody, and you're going to get a low polarization. So basically, you can, in what's called a homogeneous assay, you don't have to separate free and bound. That was the value also, unlike radioactivity. You, no separation is needed. You just get the readout of the uh, polarization, uh, depending on the concentration of the, uh, the liquid you're adding. Another very popular use of polarization came in the early 70s when Weber introduced polarization study membrane systems. And uh, he actually mentioned this idea in his thesis in 47, which we'll learn in the history lecture. And originally, they used Perlin, but one of the postdocs working with them, a co-author of that paper, was Mayor Shinisky, who went back to Israel and with Baron Host developed, introduced diphenohexatriene, showed here which for decades and decades was certainly the most popular fluorescent polarization membrane probe. Nowadays, Lordan, which you'll learn a lot about, is starting to replace it. This shows you how it would work. You would get the anisotropy, in this case, of vesicles as a function of temperature. And when you go from the, 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 um, the gel to the fluid state, you can see the dramatic drop in polarization. So this is just to give you some examples of how polarization is used. And as I mentioned um, in clinical chemistry, this is a very popular method for high throughput screening experiments. And most of these high throughput plate readers can do polar, or many of them can do polarization too. And even in the microscope, I won't discuss this now, but you can put polarizers in a microscope and by paying attention to what you're doing, you can get anisotropy or polarization images as well as intensity which again will give you information on rotational mobilities of different molecules and also has to do with FRET measurements, which we'll talk about later. Well, I guess we'll talk about it now. So FRET stands for Forster Resonance Energy Transfer. And what is FRET? Let's consider we have a molecule, we're gonna call it a donor, which can absorb light and then emit light. So that's normal. But suppose we have another molecule called an acceptor that can, we won't discuss the details yet, basically that excited state energy of the donor, when the donor is excited, it can transfer energy to the acceptor if it's within the proper distance and the proper orientation. And the acceptor can emit light. It, it doesn't have to emit light, but the most common examples are it emits light of a different wavelength. So it's a way to see when molecules are in proximity to each other. 
and the FRET process results in the decrease in fluorescence intensity and also the decrease in the lifetime of the donor, which is going to be important when we talk about lifetime measurements. And a way to think about the energy transfer, we, we have two tuning forks. We did this when I was in school. I don't know if they still do it. And you strike one tuning fork, even though it's separated in space from another one, uh, the the energy waves through the through the air can get the second tuning fork to start vibrating. So it's it's basically um, uh, the concept of it's not giving off light that excites the the acceptor. It's the excited state energy is transferred, and you can define what's called the Forster critical transfer distance, which is the distance at which between the two molecules, donor and acceptor, which half the um, Produce the efficiency of transfer will be 50%. And that'll depend on many terms of refractive index, the quantum yield of the donor in the absence of acceptor, kappa squared, the orientation factor, that is how oriented are the donor and accepted dipoles relative to each other, and the normalized overlap integral. There has to be some overlap between the donor's emission spectrum and the acceptor's uh, absorption spectrum, okay? And ways to measure the energy transfer, especially for many, many years, was largely on intensity. You see a decrease in intensity due to FRET. Here you see the donor, and then the donor in the presence of acceptor. But more important for everything you'll be doing with microscopes is, is the lifetime. You get a decrease in the lifetime. And as we'll see in tomorrow's lecture, there's many reasons why the lifetime is a superior measurement than just intensity. So you can measure efficiency of transfer by the change in the lifetime in the presence of the uh, and absence of the acceptor. So let's talk about fluorophores now. So where do fluorophores come from? Okay. So some fluorophores occur naturally in the planet or admiral world, like Quinine, we'll learn in our history lecture how important it is. Many natural, many such natural fluorophores or intrinsic fluorophores include aromatic amino acids. But modern fluorescent studies would not be possible without fluorescent molecules designed and synthesized in the laboratory. Indeed, rapid development in biological fluorescence owes much to synthetic organic chemistry, as well as to modern molecular biology and commercialization. So we can arbitrarily design, divide probes into in vitro or in silico, as the case may be, in vivo, more accurately, in cells. We can talk about intrinsic fluorophores, fluorophores that are naturally part of the system being studied, or extrinsic fluorophores, which are introduced. Intrinsic ones, and you hear a lot about them in the course, include NADH. We have several lectures on that, FAD. Porphyrins, metal-free porphyrins usually, but some metals, magnesium and zinc, still give rise to fluorescence, and some other molecules. And of course, for many of us, like myself, and certainly Enrico in his early years, the aromatic amino acids were very important for protein studies. And here we see on the left the extinction coefficients, how well they absorb for tryptophan, tyrosine phenylalanine, we see tryptophan dominates. Here on the right, we see the uh, emission spectrum of tryptophan, tyrosine phenylalanine. So normally, if you have tryptophan in a protein, that's going to dominate the emission. And um, we might hear more about this later. Um, extrinsic fluorophores are synthetic dyes or modified biochemicals added to a specimen to produce fluorescence with specific properties. There could be non-covalent interactions that just naturally bind to your target or covalent interactions. Non-covalent, for example, these molecules, ANS, bis-ANS, TNS, and there's many, many more, are very poorly fluorescent in water, but be, enhances tremendously if they bind, if they're in the hydrophobic environment away from water, which quenches them, hydrophobic patches on protein, for example. An important development in the whole field was in 99 when uh, Howland and his team at Molecular Probes, we'll talk about them later, um, introduced, recognized the need for probes with high photostability and high quantum yield. This is because 
in the 90s, fluorescent microscopy became more and more important. But probes like fluorescein, which is one of the most popular probe in biochemistry at that time, is not very photostable. It bleaches very readily under a microscope. So they realized we need other probes. And this started a revolution of photostable probes. And the first one series, which is still widely used today, are the Alexa series, derivatives of coumarin, rhodamines, fluorescenes. And these probes are very bright and very photostable. And you choose the one that matches the wavelength you're, you're looking for. And this just shows from their early work the, here we see the fluorescein being bleached with time under constant illumination, and we see Alexa doesn't bleach nearly as much. So this is why they became very popular for microscopy. And there's a wide series of, of Alexa probes, and I'm showing here the amino reactive succinamide esters. These are probes that can react with amine groups in a protein, for example. You can basically pick the color you want. But more recently, there's been other, well, signing dyes have been around a long time. These are very photostable. More recently, we have the Edo dyes that are very photostable, the dye light. So there's a series of probes um, that are much, much, much more photostable than the original fluorescein probes. Now, what about labeling proteins, which has been an interest of mine for a long time? Um, and that can include antibodies. You might want to label an antibody with a probe. Well, basically the protein have reactive groups using the lysines or the N-terminus or cysteines. And the fluorescent probe can be chosen depending on the light source you have, the spectral properties you want, if there's autofluorescence you have to worry about or photostability. So you get a fluorescent molecule with the reactive group that will react with the protein's reactive group. And of course, the main thing you worry about is that labeling does not alter the biological activity. If you have an enzyme, for example, you want to be sure it still has all the enzyme properties after you label it. Membrane probes and probes include Loradan, which is probably by, by far the most popular one now. And you'll hear a lot about Loradan in this course. And basically, the emission spectrum uh, shifts depending on the physical state in the gel phase or liquid crystalline phase. And you take advantage of this shift in the, in the spectrum. You learn all about that uh, a lot from Leonel and others in the course. Probes have been popular for years that like calcium determinations in and out of cells. And you have ratiometric methods where you have to look at the ratio of two excitation or two emission wavelengths or non-ratiometric where just the, the raw intensity or lifetime changes with and without the, uh, the calcium or, or other ions. Um, but certainly um, the big revolution for a lot of microscopy is the fluorescent protein revolution. And this has been an amazing topic in and of itself. And the idea, which I'm sure you all know, is basically you have the, the gene for the fluorescent protein can be inserted in the, into the DNA uh, next to the gene of your, your interest. And then you can basically get a protein with your like fluorescent protein attached, okay? And this was discovered by Osamu Shimomura, who was looking at, uh, a, at a quorin. And we see on the left that a quorin is a, is a bioluminescent protein in the, in the jellyfish. And basically, when you have some perturbation of the jellyfish, Calcium ions are released, and that basically activates the corn, which gives off a blue light. And right near it in the, in the jellyfish structure was a GFP, a protein that absorbs the blue light and then emits a green light. And when he was isolating the corn, he discovered this GFP. They didn't know what it was at the time, of course. Here you see a picture of Shimmer holding up GFP, not clone GFP, but GFP he got from the jellyfish. Why does the jellyfish do this, you may add? Well, first of all, it wants to make a signal and blue light will be scattered more easily than green light. That's why the sky is blue, right? The lower the wavelength, the more the light scattered. So when it changes it from blue to green, 
it can send a flash of light farther in the ocean. Why does it do this? Well, the best explanation I heard from a marine biologist was it doesn't do this necessarily to attract mates or anything else or frighten the prey, but rather if it's being attacked, it wants to alert a larger predator to come and get the first predator, which makes sense. So if big predators are around, they see a flash, they will go to it. Maybe there's a fish they can eat. And in his original work, it's amazing what uh, Shimomura did. Here you see UV illumination of the ring of the jellyfish, and you can see the GFP. And to start with, he extracted the GFP from 30,000 specimens. He got 70 milligrams of purified protein from 30,000 jellyfish weighing one and a half tons. And I suspect if most of you had to do that, you wouldn't use GFP, but it was in the outer ring. So we had to develop this ring cutting machine. He said in his paper, his hands got tired with scissors cutting the ring. So he made this ring cutting machine. So it was quite a heroic route to eventually get what we have today. And of course, it was then discovered you could make mutations in the GFP protein backbone and mutations not in the, the, three, the three amino acids that form the chromophore or the fluorophore, but around it will change the colors. And here we see, this is back in 2008, many different colors. Uh, here we have the famous fruit series, um, uh, tomato, M cherry, the M means monomeric. They make a mutation, be sure it's always monomeric. So a lot came up from that. <clears throat> and in fact, since then they discovered a lot of um, uh, fluorescent proteins and chromaros, and that became an important property. So we have a series of different uh, important mutations in different chromaros. <laughs> and again, these are largely used in, in, in cells, as you'll hear about, no doubt, um, to distinguish two different proteins or to even do energy transfer. You can have one color being the donor and one color being the acceptor. Very popular use of fluorescent proteins, okay? And just uh, no end of proteins now. And here's an interesting chart of the brightness relative to EGFP, which is enhanced GFP. And you can see that uh, depending on the wavelength of light, you can get some are much intrinsically brighter than others. You can see the wide range of wavelengths available for all of these. So you really can find almost any color you want now to express in your cells. How many have been found? Hundreds. I mean, you can't keep up with it. And there's also, besides the jellyfish, in the core, they found them in many other animals too. And I won't go into all of that now. An interesting use was proposed some years ago by Kerpola, namely uh, by molecular fluorescence. What he does is he splits the gene for GFP in two parts, for example, here. And the idea was if two pro you put one on one protein of interest, one on the other one, if the two proteins of interest bind, you may get these two halves coming together and forming a fluorescent protein. And amazingly, it works in many cases. And um, so if you do this process and you get a fluorescent protein, there's no doubt that your two target proteins came together. Otherwise, you would never have the fluorescent protein. Other ways to introduce fluorophores in cells, though, include, besides the fluorescent proteins, the halo tags, where you attach genetically the gene for a dehalogenase to your target protein, and then you introduce externally a fluorophore linked to an alkane, and this dehalogenase will link the two together. And the advantage of this is you can put any fluorophore of any color you want in. You're not limited to the colors of the, of the fluorescent proteins. It's especially useful. I've used it myself during turf, a method you'll learn about, where you're adding things, your protein is sticking through the cell membrane and you add the different probes to the external medium. Also, snap tag is another method. <clears throat> 
does a similar thing. It works on a benzoguanidine derivative, but it covalently attaches a probe to the target. The, the one advantage of this, well, besides using any color you want, is these are a bit smaller than the GFP. So maybe you do less perturbation to your target protein. And then there's other probes that are around. I won't go into details. This is just to give you some references. Certainly some among the most popular is this uh, Janelia probes by Luke Lavis's group, Janelia Farbs, and they're very bright and very photostable. And you'll probably hear uh, talks where these are included. And the final thing to mention, it's becoming more important as time goes by is quantum dots. These are semiconductors where the diameter of the semiconductor, most popular are cadmium-based, determines the fluorescence that comes out of them. And people have been able to derivatize them that put molecules of interest on the outside, but just intrinsically, the color of the quantum dot, and they're very, very bright, very high quantum yield, the, the color changes with the diameter. So basically, these are becoming popular to label biological uh, molecules with the quantum dots, and it's a whole other area. So the basic thing I want to say is um, there's now a huge number of fluorescent molecules available, unlike when Enrico and I were students where you had to synthesize the probe in the laboratory, but that's another story. So basically, I think I'm done, and I'm on time. So uh, Lena, why don't you take it now?